meeting will be held in a hybrid fashion with the opportunity for both in-person attendance and remote participation in accordance with Chapter 107 of the Acts of 2022, which extended the governor's a March 12th, 2020 orders suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, MGL 30A20, until March 31st, 2023. That's right. I'm sorry, I have to update. I didn't realize I have to update that. It has been extended again. So yeah, this is all very legal. March, like next year, right? 2024? Is it March 2024? It's extended. It's extended until a date that we can't tell you right now. Please note that while an option for remote attendance and or participation is being provided as a courtesy to the public, the meeting hearing will not be suspended or terminated if technological problems interrupt the virtual broadcast, unless otherwise required by law. Members of the public will, with particular interest in any specific item on the agenda, should make plans for in-person versus virtual attendance accordingly. For in-person attendance, the town of Deerfield will host the meeting in the main meeting room, Deerfield Municipal Offices, with remote participation. Excellent. That was lovely, Richard. 2025. 2025. That's what I thought. Yeah, thank you. Okay. <clears throat> um, with a reminder that right now our meeting guidelines for the business meeting are speaking one at a time, following our Deerfield Code of Conduct, to be respectful, considerate, courteous, and also concise, non-repetitive, and recognized by the chair. Although we might need some recognition by the vice chair when she comes because it is a little challenging for me um, in Zoom land here. <laughs> so board members in attendance, uh, Rachel Blaine. Rachel Blaine here. Emily Gaylord. Emily Gaylord here. Uh, Kathy Wittroba. Kathy Wittroba here. Kathy Sylvester. Kathy Sylvester here. <laughs> Andrea Liebson. Andrea Liebson here. Emily Wolfkohl here. And um, when Denise Mason comes, we'll then just really have a super majority, <laughs> super quorum, but we're, we're set now. Um, <clears throat> minutes. Uh, uh, we did have some you know, logistical uh, formatting things that, Amy, thank you very much for pushing that out tonight or excuse me, today. Um, are there any other for uh, February 6th? And thank you also, Rachel, for doing this. <clears throat> February 6th, are there any issues of substance not formatting that people need to um, <clears throat> request changes to? If, if so, or if not, we could have a motion to approve. <clears throat> I move that we approve the meeting minutes of February 6th, 2023. Thank you. And a second? I second that, Kathy Wittroba. Thank you, Kathy. Any further discussion? <clears throat> so since I'm the one making a roll call vote necessary this time, um, we'll go around the table. And <clears throat> now we will make note that uh, our Vice Chair, Denise Mason, is, is here. <clears throat> Emily Gaylord. February minutes. Emily Gaylord, yes. <clears throat> Kathy Wittroba. Kathy Wittroba, yes. Kathy Sylvester. Kathy Sylvester, yes. Andrea Liebson. Andrea Liebson, yes. Uh, Denise Mason. Denise Mason, yes. Uh, Rachel Blaine. Rachel Blaine, yes. Emily Wolfkohl, yes. So the minutes of uh, February 6th are approved. And how about the minutes for March 6th? Um, <clears throat> again, anything of substance. Um, uh, thank you, Amy, for connecting, correcting some of the formatting issues. Um, <clears throat> Maybe I'll have a motion and then we can have discussion. Or is there anything of substance for those minutes? No. All right. question. May I ask a question? Um, sure. Madam Chair? The, um, I was not present, but I did watch the video. How does one um, note that in the minutes? Oh, my, no, my understanding is that you need not be present in order to vote to accept the minutes if you have, in fact, read the minutes and you did super work by watching the video, so should be fine. Thank you. <clears throat> so let's see, can we have a, did somebody move? We, I don't think yet, did we move I to- I we approve the March 6th minutes, mm -hmm. Emily Gaylord. Thank you, Emily. Second? I second Dick Kathy Sylvester. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, any further discussion? Um, <clears throat> all right, uh, Rachel Blaine. Rachel Blaine, yes. 
Uh, <clears throat> Denise Mason. Denise Mason, yes. Andrea Liebson. <clears throat> Andrea Liebson, yes. Kathy Sylvester. Kathy Sylvester, yes. Kathy Watroba. Kathy Watroba, yes. And Emily Gaylord. Emily Gaylord, yes. Emily Wolfkull, yes. So the minutes are approved um, simultaneous, uh, simultaneous. <laughs> Unanimously, it's been a, a long day with toddlers. Um, so old business, we have our public hearing continuation um, of sunny days, site plan review, and um, uh, we can make note of the guests who are attending. If you could identify yourself, please. Hi, good evening, everybody. I'm John Furman. I'm the engineer of record uh, with VHB. Thank you. <clears throat> Muted, Ken. I'm Ken Boquillen, owner of the property. Thank you. Um, and Chris Chamberlain, Berkshire Design Group, we're the peer reviewer on behalf of the town. Thank you very much, and welcome to all three of you. Um, <clears throat> so, as we are continuing, um, really appreciate the work that has been done in between meetings and. Um, Maybe, Mr. Furman, if you'd like to uh, begin with the discussion, and then Mr. Chamberlain, you can um, join in. Sure, be happy to. Uh, so just uh, kind of uh, where we've been since the last meeting. Uh, last Friday, Ken and myself attended a site walk with three members of the planning board. We were able to walk around, and uh, we had imported the site plan into our ArcGIS software. And using our handheld phone, we were able to walk the property to the corners of each building. So uh, while we're there, you could kind of look around and you could see the trees that would be left and get an idea of the uh, of the, the, the development. Uh, also, uh, the initial peer review um, uh, comment letter from Berkshire Design had two parts. It had a zoning part and it had a stormwater part. Uh, at the last meeting, we had yet to uh, tackle the stormwater. We've had two meetings with uh, Lucy and Chris from Berkshire Design. Our engineer uh, has gone through uh, and addressed the comments. Our intent on that is to kind of work through and uh, the remaining comments and get a formal submittal back to the town and Berkshire Design, addressing the stormwater so that we can enter a dialogue and get these wrapped up uh, for the for the next meeting. There are a handful of other comments that we are addressing at the same time, uh, replacing the uh, the uh, one parking space, which we inadvertently uh, deleted, adding uh, three um, uh, uh, EV charging uh, stations to the, uh, the campus, one at the uh, testing lab and two at the cultivation building. Uh, and then uh, we are also uh, in our Conservation Commission uh, hearing. We received comments from the DEP. Um, uh, uh, Berkshire Design has received those as well. So it's extremely advantageous that we have the same peer reviewer. Uh, so we can kind of work both uh, commissions and boards together uh, as we address the comments. And you all get the same documents. Uh, so uh, last Tuesday, which was the cutoff of getting information to the board for this meeting, we submitted a, a letter that con contains some uh, supplemental information. And that was at the request of the board to, uh, who had asked for more uh, specificity on some of the items. Um, so if possible, I'd like to share my uh, screen uh, to kind of walk through some of these things and uh, show you what we had and uh, answer some questions or put those items to rest. All right. Uh, before you start sharing, if anyone, if any of you need to move your chairs yeah. so that you can see the screen, please feel free. And Annalie, you're muted. <clears throat> Mr. Chamberlain, is there anything you'd like to um, state before we go to the screen share? Um, no, I think that that was a good summary. Uh, you know, at, at this point, we haven't seen the revised plan set or stormwater report, so we're anxious to dig into that when it comes in. Um, and, you know, as we go through these more zoning-related comments, uh, I'll be happy to, to chime in at the appropriate times. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay, Mr. Furman. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah, 
So we'll start with the uh, the cover letter that we submitted because this really kind of has the four <laughs> items that we were uh, looking at. So when we started having a discussion last meeting about the traffic study, and we had mentioned that uh, the traffic counts that we had based our study on were taken from a 2016 mass DOT counting station, and then they were increased by percentage every year uh, to the current year. And this was done um, because of the situation we, are ha we have with COVID, where uh, roadways are seeing less traffic because more people are working from home. And the board had asked that we take traffic counts to just to show that the assumption that we made is, is valid. So uh, the two things, so attachment A to this letter contains the actual traffic counts we received from our vendor. And when you look at those, there's four numbers I have highlighted here. So from the actual counts, the northbound volumes on Route 5 and 10, 3,575 average trips per day in the northbound, 3,594 uh, in the southbound uh, direction. So that now converting over and looking at the counts we did from 2016 and growing them, uh, our analysis was based on 9,019 for the northbound and 6,802 for the southbound. So what this basically does is confirms that the assessment that we, we performed was based on a higher volume of traffic. Uh, we, uh, the conclusions in that report said that we're not anticipating that there are going to be any offsite improvement issues needed because of that. So since we are now experiencing less traffic, that statement uh, still holds. All right. Um, planning board, maybe at the at the end of each of these sections, um, are there any questions uh, for Mr. Furman or Mr. Chamberlain on uh, the traffic study? Uh, no, but John, I'm sorry, would you mind, or Mr. Furman, I'm sorry, would you mind um, just collapsing the comments field so we can zoom in a little bit more, especially for those um, residents that are in the audience? with us because they don't for have the old eyes. <laughs> it's definitely not because of that. No, <laughs> for sure. Not because we're old. There we go. That's How's that? Right. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Thank you. I um, do appreciate that you did the updated um, traffic numbers. Any other questions? And Denise, you may need to um, call on people because I, I definitely can't see with the small screen. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Tree, tree preservation. All right. So tree preservation was the uh, second item that I had listed as a, a note from the meeting. We are asking for a waiver of the tree inventory, uh, and uh, we currently do not have a, a landscaping plan uh, for the for the project. So uh, what we uh, had provided. Let me see. I think it's this one. How do I get to it here? Okay, so this is the overall plan that was submitted as part of the, the documents. Nothing has changed on this plan, um, except that the tree line that is on that plan, I've turned to red. And one of the comments uh, that came from the last planning board meeting was that we really don't know where the, how, what you're clearing. You're saying five acres, but we don't know where it is. So this, this red line is shown on the design plans that we submitted. And this is our proposed uh, tree clearing limit. So inside of this line is, a, uh, is about 4.95 acres. So we're just rounding up to five. So that's this, so every, everything between these red lines is the areas that we are going to be uh, clearing. Um, we had mentioned before, we have two wetland crossings. One is here, the other is here. Uh, the members of the, the board that were at the uh, site walk actually got to walk through those to see what they look like. <laughs> They look a lot more impressive on this plan than they do in the field. They're really just minor, uh, minor crossings. Um, so to support the request for the tree inventory, uh, should keep track of which one I had open. There we go. So uh, we went and did some research on the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Uh, <laughs> that what we ended up finding is that in 2012 they provided some. Um, analysis that classified uh, trees within an area based on uh, the density. So for the this site here, which we classified as a medium density forest, we're anticipating 905 trees will be cut. And what is uh, unique about this is that the trees themselves, uh, the front area of the site has been cleared previously and most of the growth from the right-of-way line into, I'm gonna say about a third to a half of the way in, 
are small growth trees. They're probably six to eight to 10 inch diameter. When you get to the back of the site, the size of the trees get a little bit uh, bigger, uh, but they're not, they're, this is not a uh, pristine forest that is full of, uh, you know, natural oaks and, and, um, and trees that are very large in, in area or in, in diameter. We have some of those in there, but it's not the predominant, um, not the predominant uh, characteristic of this, of this site. We also have 28 acres uh, for the, the, the site. Oh, this thing's in the way here, mm -hmm. move it, all right. And so what we're showing, we don't show um, the, the entire boundaries of the site, but this is the first parcel. This is the one that we're doing the development on. And the second parcel here, uh, which is just to the north. So the two of these parcels total 28 acres. And all we're really intending to do at this point is just to clear these five. So that's 23 acres of the remaining site that'll that'll remain. Uh, we have no plans at this point uh, to clear cut them, to open cut them. It'll just remain uh, as it is. From a, a landscape landscaping perspective, what uh, we've done is we've consulted with Ken, and we've consulted a uh, landscape architect, and you can see that we are only cutting these trees to the point that we are needing it for development or for grading. What's not shown on this plan are the limits of grading. So for instance, um, between the basin here, this is the outline of the basin, uh, between this line here and this area down here, we have grading in here. So uh, that's why it looks like there's blank areas and you might say, well, let's bring this in and get it closer here. We can't because we have that grading line there. So what our, our updated plan set is going to be is within these detention basin areas, we'll be spotting some, um, some river birch trees. A landscape architect that we team with on a regular basis has suggested that because that river birch has a characteristic where it likes to get wet and then dry out and they will, they'll function very well in here. So we'll, we won't um, overly plant these because as a stormwater management feature, we have to get in there, we have to maintain them. Any sediment that builds up in there, we have to be able to clean it out, but we will add enough so that they're, they're uh, you know, uh, dressed up and that they're not just bland uh, 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 fields of grass, I guess, if you would. So, so with those two items, that's what we have to address the, uh, the tree preservation area. This is approximately what we're estimating we will take out. And then um, uh, the, the plan with the red line shows the limits. Uh, the erosion control barrier goes along that red line. So that is conservation commission requires us to stake that li limit of work with the barrier. So no work goes on the outside of it. So once it's approved, that's where the erosion control barrier will be. And then that's our project. Thank you. Um, planning board comments on the trees. Um, yeah, this is Denise Mason. When we went through, I mean, I was anticipating a much denser forest, but it really wasn't. And I think most of the trees were, were really tiny, or as I said, they were scrappy trees. <laughs> I mean, there were, there were a number of large ones, but, you know, I mean, I, I didn't count them. There weren't as many large ones as I anticipated. And I think Mr. Furman had also stated that it looked like it had been <laughs> logged in the past because they were not mature trees. They were very small. And, you know, some of the ones, um, the evergreen trees, they're they're ready to go anyway, because I think the evergreen trees that were there typically don't have a very deep root system. So they're prone, prone to Topple. toppling over in a storm. So it wasn't, I mean, I was, I felt pretty confident about what their plans were with the trees at this point. I don't know. Um, there, mm -hmm. Oh, Emily. <laughs> Thanks, Denise. Uh, Mr. Berman, can you go back to the tree line image? Because I wanted to just point something else out to the folks that couldn't go to the site visit. So if you see where the driveway is marked, um, what it's doing, and please correct me if I'm wrong, Ken or uh, Mr. Berman, um, the state owns like a big chunk of that parcel right along 5 and 10. So we can't clear that anyway, correct? Yes. So it's correct. You have to walk through when we walked it. Um, we all wore our good boots. Um, you have to walk through quite a bit of tree cover to even access where the site is going to be, which means from the road, I don't even know if the building's going to be visible. It's just mm -hmm. going to be what it looks like now. So I think in terms of 
building something of this scale and preserving the look and feel of how five and 10 is right now, it comes pretty close as, as we can get it. That's good to know. Um, I certainly appreciate that um, most of them are, as you're saying, sort of scrappy trees with only the larger ones at the end, at the back of the property. And potentially, as Denise, as you say, that, um, you know, they may be sort of old and prone to toppling over anyway. We do have a fairly specific, our, our bylaws quite specific when we're asking about the tree uh, <clears throat> replacement, the, the tree cutting you know, within the within the property itself, I'm not talking about the inventory. When we talk about trees greater than 19 inches in diameter at a 60 60 inch height, and um, as as I think of precedent and what we've also requested of other applicants when they have requested um, <clears throat> a waiver from uh, replacing those trees. Uh, I mean, uh, 905 trees also out of approximately 5,000 is 18%. I mean, that's in my accounting days, anything greater than 10% is a material number. So I guess um, I would just still like to say that if there could be something more for me at least to hold on to in terms of the number of the 19 inch diameter trees that you're talking about removing, that would, give me some um, better confidence in, in granting that replacement waiver. Uh, so at, at any, at, at, that you can return to, you don't need to answer that now. Yeah, so, so if I'm understanding that your request, you would still like anything 19 inches in diameter and greater located in, or inventory. No, I, I mean, we will still need to grant, we will still need to address, basically, as I understand it, there's two waivers. One is the tree inventory overall, right? Right. And then, and then secondly, there is the issue of replacing trees, the more mature trees that are 19 inches of, in diameter or greater at a, at a 60 inch height. And that's the part that um, feels a little bit more nebulous to me i think the uh, what you have shown at least as far as i'm concerned and the folks who went on the site visit are reiterating are corroborating um you know i'm not sure that i i don't think a, a total i don't imagine a total tree inventory is is warranted well i i, I think ken can uh, jump in and uh, correct me if i'm wrong but I, I i think the intent of our request is that we have 28 acres of wooded area. And uh, we are proposing to not touch uh, 23 acres of it and just leave it as it is in exchange for doing uh, a replacement uh, program for, for trees. The, the bylaw that you have seems to work really well for a site that's being uh, completely uh, clear cut. And that's not what we're trying to do. You can tell by the tree cutting limits that we have, we brought this in as tight as we can. In some areas, we're right up against the, the wetland line, like in this area, we're in the majority of the other ones, we've tried to stay 25 feet away, but we do have areas where we've gotten close. Um, so our, our intent in, in the request for the waiver would be that in exchange for planting a replacement tree, uh, we can certainly do the uh, the the river birch as kind of an aesthetics type of of planting, but the intent would be that we would not do uh, the replacement value as stated in the bylaw because we have so much that we're preserving. Mm -hmm. I understand, and that's a good rationale, and I appreciate that. It's just ugh, there's that piece. Are we talking about there's five trees that are older, bigger trees, or are we talking about a hundred? I I I have no idea of the scope with that and we have requested of other applicants that they you know give us a little you know if we're if we're if we're asking for a waiver so the the planning board may decide that's not important and this is just my opinion but um if that's i would like to have a little bit more understanding as to what we're talking about with cutting down the mature trees 
Excuse me, this is Andrea. So given given the location, given the fact that there will be a um, uh, like a curtain of trees around every around everything, um, I don't think it's a typical building site where trees are gone, a building's put in, and then you just see this building. There will be trees buffering all the views, as far as we could tell from the um, from the site visit. But dramatically it was, it was dramatic i mean the noise from the street was gone uh including from 91 once we were in the center of the um of the building area so it's not gonna look denuded of trees um based on what the trees are there and what we could see that would be maintained okay. so it maybe rest a little more assured um Adelaide. thank you this rich point it may not be simply though the nature, it, it may be also just the environmental impact of large mature trees. So we, and since we weren't on the visit, that that I think is part of what we're concerned about is what, just the environmental impact of losing large mm -hmm. mature trees. I mean, we just lost one to, we yeah, and I just went lost one to, uh, to the natural the yeah. re resources. I mean, trees go down, I get it, but that, I think that was part of the, what Annalise tagged right, yeah. here. And yeah, the, there certainly were not a hundred, I mean, I, you know, I didn't count, count them. I didn't take my tape to count them, which maybe I should have. But I'd say at the m most would be 20 trees, and I don't even think there are that many. Hmm. Yeah, I, I'd, like, I'd like to thank the ladies for coming out and walking the property with us last Friday. And I was just going to say there's definitely less than 25 large trees that we're going to cut down out of everything. Um, and they were predominantly in the cultivation building area. Um, which is in the center of the property. Thank you. We'd like to thank the the boys for taking us around too. <laughs> Did you know? <laughs> Can I just? This is uh, Kathy Matropa. I would just like to add something too. So, I mean, we're not we're not talking about the Lorax here. We, I understand that, but not all trees are created equal, right? And mm -hmm. these large trees are their ability to exchange right. carbon right. dioxide and right. oxygen. <laughs> Right. And so our wooded areas become really important, especially in an area like this, where there's a lot of exhaust and a lot of traffic and a lot of need for those trees to breathe for us so that we're not breathing that as well. Right. So I, I, I don't think this is an alarming situation. Again, it's not we're not. It's, I do just think it's worthy of what we're expecting in other areas and um, the value of those adult trees. It's, it's, they're not all created equal. It takes a long time for a tree to be really functionally um, working on the behalf of the humans in the yeah. space they are growing in. Thank you. So uh, Madam Chair, you had mentioned that, you know, that that was your opinion and uh, you didn't know how the other board members felt. Could we maybe put this for a vote and see what, what the the uh, uh, the directive is moving forward? Whether we go out in this area and locate these trees? Well, I'm oh, I'm, I'm a little un, un, <clears throat> let's see to think for a minute about doing a, a vote. I mean, um, you certainly do have a follow up in a number of areas. Um, an estimate is fine. Also, again, you know, something that yes. feels yes. like a ballpark of what it is that you're asking us to waive. So, uh, you know, one thought that might be a middle ground that I had is if there are, you know, define a representative area and do a, a count in a limited area, uh, just sort of like, like John, like you estimated the, the 900 some trees based on the agricultural records, you know, if, if there's a representative, I don't know what the right size is, um, um, that's small enough that a count is reasonable. That's also, you know, able to be extrapolated. It does sound like the large trees are clustered in in one particular area. So um, choosing that area may may uh, you know perhaps there may need to be two locations or, or carefully chosen so it's actually representative. But that may be a way to avoid having to go through the exercise of actually counting while getting a reasonable estimate. Yeah. We, we can we can assure you that there's that there's definitely less than 25 large trees um, that will be cutting down. There's a lot of 
swamp swamp maple and just really smaller trees like this big around um the front has pretty much zero um it's just in the part of the cultivation area the where there's some pine trees um or hemlock so i'm not sure what they are what are they john back there there's there's a lot most of it's pine yeah and and as we went on the walk most of those trees in the last storm a lot of the branches had snapped off and they were laying on the ground um we walked right through it so yeah, there's definitely less than like 25 trees on this entire five acres that are um, 21 inches or bigger that will actually be cutting. Um, if you go farther back and farther to the north, um, there's thousands of trees that are big and that's why we stayed out of those areas. That estimate of 20 or 25 um, is, help, is extremely helpful to me. Thank you. And I guess I feel a little bit um, soothed maybe because it's a high performance building and it's not burning copious amounts of fossil fuels or other things that would have a huge impact on our environment as well. Um, so I, I mean, not to discount, and Kathy's absolutely right, that um, especially in an area like this surrounded yeah. by highway trees are absolutely critical. And I do feel better knowing that we're not going to be putting even more fossil fuels and carbon into the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And there's an offset, this is Rachel, there's an offset of the other property. I do appreciate that too. Yeah. I mean, I think we just, we don't want to, we, we've made it by law, we made it for a variety of and reasons. And we did it on not purpose. The, not the least of which was right. to, to retain a rural nature, wooded mm -hmm. nature of the area. So, but it also is for the environment to impact the trees. Yeah. So, yeah. And Mr. Furman, I'm not sure who I should um, address this to. Approximately how many river birch trees I mean, you said that they really absorb a lot of water. So I'm wondering how, how many. I mean, you, you said you don't want to densely plant them to have access, but. Uh, I, yeah, I, I, I would have to really consult our, our landscape architect, but I don't see us getting any closer than like 20 feet uh, on center with the trees because once a sediment gets in there, we have to get a machine in there, small bobcat to be able to move around and scoop out the sediment that's in there. And you're going to want some area uh, for that maneuverability. So uh, what we're planning to do is to, as part of the updated plan set that we're having is to show in these areas here where these basins are, uh, are the, the river birch. So there's nine basins, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine and so those are the areas where we'd be concentrating them so i mean even if we did six uh trees in each basin that's 50 something trees that's more than we're cutting down so you know the math is that way and you're not you're not going to get six trees in a in a small basin like this one so so perhaps could we get that in writing like these are the kind of specifics that i think we've been asking for is we're probably going to be taking down fewer than 25 mature trees. We'll be planting this many river birch. This is how the math works out. I think like those are the numbers we'd really love to see. Sure. Well, the, um, the, the, the plantings we would have on an updated plant. So you'd have those in front of you. Thank you. Yeah, I was going to say, I think we, we would uh, recommend uh, a planting plan um, that comes from the landscape architect. Uh, the the river birch are maybe okay, um, but the, we do have a little bit of concern with how wet the bottom of those basins are going to be throughout the spring. River birch like wet feet for a little while, um, but given that the bottom of the basins are right at groundwater, uh, they're probably going to be totally saturated for a few months, and that's uh, iffy with river birch really with, with a lot of mature trees. Um, so I think that that just being clear that a landscape architect really understands the environment here. Um, there, there are actually very few large trees that will that'll do well, totally saturated. Um, and then the other concern we would have is that the basins are um, in the current plan going to be lined with an impermeable liner. Uh, but if that's then pierced with several trees, there's there's a, a give and take on that. So that, that's something that we'd be mindful of. Thank you. Yeah, it's. Correct me if I'm wrong, John, but we, we can't plant trees in the basins. Um, they're lined with clay. You're not allowed. That That's that's uh, the opposite of the concept of what we're doing. I think there's a, some, a few places around um, the edges. I mean, right over here, I can't move my cursor, but I think there's a couple places around the edges. Um, 
but in reality, um, we're sticking to the spirit of the law and we're, uh, and we're trying to like, uh, cut as few as possible. So doing that, it doesn't leave us a bunch of room to plant, you know, 50 more trees. Um, cause we're cutting bare minimal. I mean, if you wanted us to cut more trees and, and plant, well, that's, that's sort of against the, you know, the spirit of, the, uh, of what it's about too. Um, so I think, we're going to put some trees around the edges and John will, um, you know, submit a landscaping plan, but I, I doubt there's room for 50. I think maybe we might get 20, you know, river birch on the edges of these, uh, you know, these areas. But I, if, as you see, we've cut down apps, we're going to cut down absolutely bare minimum just to make the project work. Certainly. I think as Emily mentioned, if we can't have, as many specifics as you're able to estimate, that would be very helpful. If you want to go on, John, I think we probably exhausted. Sure. <laughs> All right. Uh, so the the next uh, uh, item was was basically responding to one of the peer review comments from the first review regarding the lighting plan and if it complied with the uh, uh, the zoning bylaw. So we sent the bylaw to the lighting designer and they have updated the, the lighting plan to the one that was submitted with this correspondence. Uh, they're all LED fixtures. There's a total of 16 of them and they're either single head or, or double head uh, fixtures. Uh, because we're so far back, we really don't have any light spillage over the, uh, uh, the property line, except for the driveway. We have one light right here where we really need it because as you're coming out the driveway, um, you know, we want to light that up. This is going to be an area that's elevated. It's going to have guardrails on the side, but we got to have uh, adequate lighting here to allow safe passage. But when you get to the roadway, you can see that we're quite a bit back uh, and they're already zero. So it's just enough to, to, to uh, provide some guidance over here. Our property lines are really as so far away that uh, zooming up on all of them, we have zeros pretty much everywhere going out of it. Our fixture is an LED fixture. The height is limited to 14 feet as per your bylaw. Uh, and so I think the, uh, the, the narrative that we provided in the cover letter basically says that we comply with that. I also asked for uh, the designer to give me the, the equipment specifications for the lighting. So that's what it's going to look like. It's an LED fixture. Um, and then these are all the specifics. Uh, I think there's uh, 42 pages uh, in this specification um, on the pole, the ionization of the, of the metal, the light spread, the light bulbs that are in there, everything that's in there. So there's more information here than you probably need, but the, so that's, that takes care of that. And the last item, oh, I'm sorry, if there's any questions on those. Any other questions on lighting? Yeah, the, uh, so I would just give some context. Uh, we work with Apex Lighting a lot um, on our own projects, and they're usually very careful with their lighting design. Um, I'm not a lighting expert, but looking at the, the photometric plan, um, I mean, it looks like they've got enough light for safety. It's spread relatively well. And I think on this site, critically, um, well, the property lines are distant, uh, the sensitive environmental areas are really close, uh, but in general, the lights are shedding from the edges of the site toward the center, and I saw a lot of zeros and 0 0.1s uh, right along that, that woods boundary, which, which is important, I think. Excellent. Any other questions, any questions on this from the planning board? Okay. We know you're also managing security too, so that's often a mm -hmm. challenge there, give and take with the lighting. All right, building orientation. Yeah, so uh, this last one is information that was actually provided directly from Sunny Days, so I may ask Ken to kind of walk through it, but there's a couple uh, uh, areas that were in that submittal, and he provided information on the cultivation technology and the efficiency. Uh, the sustainability of the building, the odor mitigation, and the technologies pertaining to the cultivation and, and grow process. Uh, one of the uh, items that uh, were in the back of one of these were the renderings. And Ken, uh, I, I don't know if you've had a chance to see them. Did you guys see me flop screens? Yes. Are you looking at a rendering? Okay. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. This is the uh, rendering of the, the actual dispensary building. So it has a uh, a black front with uh, wood shingles, uh, 
kind of an exterior post and beam uh, type of roof design. There's another uh, rendering from the side that kind of shows this is the entrance to the building and this is the design. The entry for the, uh, the cultivation building kind of mirrors this. It has a couple of posts like this with an extended roof. That building is, you know, is it's 26,000 square feet is a, a larger metal type building uh, for, for cultivation, but it, it carries components of this uh, design through to the, uh, to the cultivation building. Uh, Ken, I didn't have one for the uh, testing building. I don't know if one's been developed yet or not. We have not developed one. Um, we just have the layout. It, it, it'll be a Butler building with a similar type of entrance to walk in. Um, but the rest of the building will be typical, like the other side of this building. Yeah. Uh, so I just wanted to splash those up. Uh, and those are uh, a version of these are included in this information that we submitted uh, for this section. So, Ken, um, do you want to walk through uh, these sections? Are you able to? Can you pull up the. Oh, hold on. Yeah. Um, I might mention to you, Ken, and this might be something for even our next meeting. And one of the things that I recently was brought forward to me is that the planning board is in fact the authority overseeing the section of our bylaws that has to do with marijuana facilities in town. And, you know, in general, the planning board really only cares about what happens outside of the building. We don't really, I mean, we like to know and we care about what's happening inside, but that's not our purview. Not quite the same with potentially with the marijuana uh, oversight. So I'll just say that I'm, I'm asking for some uh, legal opinions on what do we have to, you know, what do we really have to do about with that? So in the meantime, there might be some more questions or if you wanna be more superficial with what you're saying now is fine, but um, you, got, uh, you, you might wanna take a look at our bylaws that have to do with the marijuana facilities in town and the planning board's role in that. We're, we're, in the, we're a little bit in the dark on that also, so yeah. anyway. So, so be before Ken actually answers that, so the initial submittal that uh, we put together um, had uh, all the components that followed that special permit uh, criteria. So all the information that the board asked for was included in, in the initial submittal. Uh, and if you call during the first meeting, uh, Lucy from Berkshire Design thought that there were pages missing because the numbering in that submittal kind of skipped. And I explained that I had taken the information from sunny days and I had broken it apart. So it actually went in accordance with the schedules and the sections in your bylaws. So you have everything from the marijuana special permit in that initial submittal for you to review. Okay, what this was, was uh, kind of in response to the comment about the building being highly efficient mm -hmm. and Thank asking you. for more specificity for that. So I don't believe uh, Ken's gonna get into the actual process for growing and how they do things. But I think this pertains more to the equipment and the heat recovery and the energy recovery that's being part of that. And Thank it's you. again, it's in response to the question of, of the board. Thank you. Um, Mr. Furman, did you say that there was a rendering of the manufacturing building as well? Did you just show us the dispensary? Did you show us both? That was the two uh, renderings of the dispensary. Uh, I have not seen one for the either the cultivation or the testing building, but we provided exterior elevations for those. They're not they're not colored renderings like that. We don't. We haven't been able to find those, the um, exterior elevations. All we have are site plans. There is no rendering yet of um, the cultivation building or the third party testing lab. Um, they are typical Butler buildings, so they will look like that, uh, similar to the other, uh, you know, the, the right hand side of the cultivation. Um, but we have not done a rendering of those buildings. Okay, well, that's why we can't find them. <laughs> I, I just have a quick question, too. This is Kathy Wachova. So the third party testing building, what's the third party? And what's being tested? I don't think I understand the right. concept of what so, goes on in that building. So um, we're not allowed as Sunny Days isn't allowed to own a testing facility. Obviously, there's a conflict of interest there. Um, so we have a company, Confidence Analytics, out of Washington and California that 
um, that I've known for a long time because I operated my um, other facility in in, C in the Seattle area. Um, so they're they're they've been working with the the town here. They're trying to get their HCA. So they will just uh, lease that building from us, and they will operate their own company there. Um, and it, that that company will be testing product and employing people from you know the area and in, in the state, um, and just strictly we will just own the building and be leasing it to them. the The benefit for us is uh, we don't have to drive to Holyoke or we don't have to drive you know down to Springfield to get our product tested. Um, it's 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 much easier for us. And then the other big benefit too is they'll probably be producing some. Um, pretty high paying jobs people need to be skilled um in those laboratories so you know there'll be people from the area that will be uh, able to get some pretty well paying skilled jobs and they're testing for um contaminants state oh. testing yeah mandatory state testing all right uh, um will you do manufacturing in the in your other building, the the growing building, grow where is yeah. that? Yes. Made? Yep. Yeah, there will be manufacturing, cultivation, and oh. manufacturing in that same building. Got it. Correct. So uh, um, this was included as part of the initial submittal uh, in a separate directory. So what I can do is I can email this to Amy for the the board members as well. But th this is not our rendering, but it's the exterior elevations for the that cultivation building. So this is the side of the building that is facing uh, Interstate 91. And this is the side of the building that is uh, facing five and 10. So there's that entryway that I told you kind of mimics the entryway design that's on the, the dispensary. This is the Southern um, view. This is a loading dock, which you can see in this door right here. So that door is on the side of this wall. And this entry here, you can see from the side, has the same elements as the, as the bless you, as the um, uh, dispensary building. And then this is the other side of the building. Uh, that's the entry building that's further on the other side of the building. We have a delivery door. Uh, kind of a mechanical room, and then just two entry doors for uh, for space uh, for mechanics. But th this, I can send this in as part of the thing, but it was already included in it. Uh, I don't have one of these yet for the uh, testing um, building, but we can. I can certainly see if we can come up with something that give you an idea what it looks like. The building will be, the testing building will be the same shape. It's just much much smaller. This is a 26,000 square foot building. The testing lab is only 5,000. Oh, 5,000. Uh, can I just ask a quick question about a product? The product, Rachel, have, yes. it's Rachel Blank. This is for Ken. Um, product shipping, will that, um, how much product, like percentage wise, are you going to be shipping off site and how much will you be selling in? in uh, that's a great question. It depends on how much is bought locally. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> it depends on how much support we have, but right. um, in general, we plan on uh, probably it, it, our goal is to sell 30% of our product in our own dispensary. And then I've already forged some relationships with people in the Boston area and other clients that we're building facilities for that own dispensaries. So I'd say it's probably where our goal is, you know, 70, 30, 70% um, in the Boston area, 30% locally. Uh, but that's really going to depend on how much uh, support we have from the local community. I have one more question uh, regarding the third party building. So the Kathy, building... is that Kathy Wachova? No, I'm sorry. So the building is owned by Sunny Days. You're leasing it out to a third party <laughs> company, but you're you hold the liability for the building. Yeah, we own the building. We just lease it to them. Thank you. So Ken, uh, how did you want to go through uh, this this document? Well, uh, after Annalise's comment, I'm not sure like how deep you want to dig into it. Um, and that's <laughs> they can just tell me. I mean, I could take up an hours going through the you know efficiency of this building. 
Um, this is quite, you know, uh, extensive document that we gave. Um, I'm not sure how much they want to know other than, you know, we have a winter insulation package with this is goes far above and beyond the, the you know typical R value that's required. Um, that's so we can contain our you know our complete cultivation in there. So basically, we have a building inside a building. Um, so we have a highly insulated winter package on this exterior of the building. We also use insulated uh, freezer panels, um, which are high R value inside the building. So. Um, as far as efficiency goes, it's it's extremely efficient, and and that aspect of the building. I think in terms of uh, you know not doing a terribly a big deep dive, but I know in <clears throat> with other public hearings, odor miti <clears throat> mitigation has been a large concern with the community. So maybe if you could address that to some degree. Sure. Yeah, so um, the building will have uh, everything exiting the building, um, any of the exhaust or um, anything going out. Like when we bring makeup air in um, just for for humans, uh, for creature comfort areas, um, you know, that 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 air is all um, run through a carbon filter. Um, anything that exits is run through a carbon filter. Um, these these will be maintained per manufacturing specifications, um, and th they won't allow any smell to get outside our building. Um, and th and the law is that we can't have any smell um, at the property line. Um, that's that's the state law. Um, this building, as the ladies saw on the on the walk, is very much in the middle of a a, a pretty good forest. You can't really see ninety one. Pretty hard to see the five ten. Um, so, you know, we're, we're definitely to the spirit of the law and the, and the odor mitigation will be taken care of with these large charcoal filters, um, that, that remove any kind of smell or particulates before it goes outside. Thank you. <clears throat> um, other questions from the planning board. And then I think otherwise our next steps really are, <clears throat> as you talked earlier, or, or have communicated to some degree, Mr. Furman, that um, <clears throat> only the drainage related issues might be sort of more in detail at our next <clears throat> meeting. These were our more of our outstanding zoning issues, although Mr. Chamberlain and, and Berkshire Design are still certainly following up on some of the peer review comments. Our, our hope is that between now and the next meeting, um, Berkshire Design and VHB work out all the uh, drainage issues so that the peer review letter can say that the items have, have been addressed and then we can provide you with as little or as much detail as you want on what the, the system is. Um, one of the things that uh, we are struggling with right now is uh, soil testing. Uh, and um, the, the, the soil testing that was done was for the buildings, very consistent throughout the site. So mm -hmm. one of the discussions that we had with, uh, with Chris is is a compromise to saying that we'll go out with a hand auger and we'll dig some shallow test pits because we're really only interested in the top three or four feet and um, if we can provide some results from that uh, Berkshire Design uh, might have a basis for um, supporting a request to say that once we have the site cleared and we get machinery out there we do additional testing um, but the hand augers would give us an idea of our, if our assumptions that we've made for the design are, are correct or if they're way off. So we've agreed to do that. Uh, we're probably going to get out there this week and hand auger nine uh, holes. I won't be doing it. My staff will be doing it. But uh, it uh, <laughs> or uh, I'll, probably be, I'll probably be doing it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think as your peer reviewer, I think they should witness firsthand what the borings are, so they should be out there too. <laughs> I'll be I'll be glad to come watch you dig. <laughs> so so that's that's kind of the the motive for the next uh, the next couple of weeks is to really work through the stormwater. Uh, get the data, uh, and, and at the same time, we're addressing the comments for the Conservation Commission because they really go hand in hand. They're both talking about the same thing, and that's mm -hmm. kind of where we're at. Okay, so I think um, we do have a continuation form that I believe, Mr. Furman, you've already signed. Yes. And I'll be signing this week um, to continue to our next meeting, which is, I believe, May 6th. Yes. 
I just have, I'm sorry. I need to go back to the odor I'm question. <laughs> um, I just feel like as someone who lives in this beautiful region of Western Massachusetts, where we have no shortage of dispensaries, there is an odor around all of them. And I'm just curious if there's a state law that's supposed to prohibit that. Is that just users in the parking lot? Or are you going to, like, how are we going to manage that? Because I mean, you drive by any one of them and it smells like my college dorm room. Like, I don't know what to tell you. You're talking about the dispensary now. Well, just in general, the odors in general that are coming from the, yeah, the dispensary. Really? Yeah, I'm not seeing that. You've never, no. 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 Multiple places but in the, Northampton. But I know. I've gone to the dispensary in Northampton. I didn't even smell it inside the building. Nope. I think that the <laughs> row facilities are the ones that we are most, yeah, there you go. Users in the parking lot. I don't know if we can do anything. No, I know. Yeah, but just, just where it's coming from because well, maybe I just have a very sensitive nose, but I don't think so. No, I but maybe Ken, as you had talked about this, you said that there's a state requirement that uh, beyond certain boundaries, there's no odor. Well, what if there is odor? So I can assure you, if you're going to a dispensary or near a cultivation facility and you're smelling cannabis, um, that is against the state regulation and law. Um, there is no loitering. There is no public use of cannabis allowed. Um, and at the property line, there shouldn't be any smell. So if there is, they're violating state law. It's it's that clear. Um and and we have designed we've designed this facility. Um, there will be no smell outside the cultivation building. We control all that with an automated building automation system, which is fully automated. Um, and like I said, we scrub that air with carbon filters and get rid of it. So I can assure you, you won't be smelling any on our facility. Um, and if there is somebody using uh the product in the parking lot our security will be immediately escorting them off our property um and then once they get off our property we don't have control of what they do but if you're driving by a facility and you can smell it they are violating state law you know ju just for clarification this is denise mason i ride my bike a lot in the summertime when some of the local farmers were growing hemp that's what it smelled like. And I think people have this misconception that it's going to smell like that, which mm -hmm. smells similar. But, but it doesn't out of the facilities. No, the it won't out of the facility. Mm -hmm. But when I was riding my bike down Stillwater Road. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I, you just brought up, I'm mm -hmm. sorry, this I is mean, Kathy Petrani. You, you brought up a good point, Ken. So you have your own security uh, um, mm -hmm. on staff. We have to, by state law, we have to have somebody making sure there's no one lo loitering around. Um, they're not security. They're not allowed to carry guns. We're not allowed to have it, you know, guns on this property. Um, but it will be a person. If somebody's there loitering, they're there to go ask them, please, can you keep it moving? Sure. Thank you. The cameras must pick up Similar whatever we got going on out there. Yeah. All state yeah. Regulated. Perfect. Entrances. Thank you. Impenetrability. That was sorry. This is Rachel Blaine, but at the time that these laws were being established, there was so much around, mm. and so it's all in there. It's all in the state code. It's not yeah. anything we have to worry about necessarily. As it's, it, I mean, it's you know, I've been a farmer my entire life, um, raised cattle um, in Connecticut since the early '80s. Um, you know, when the farmers out there cutting fifty acres of grass, nobody's complaining that it smells like cut grass. You know what I'm saying? So like farmers have to graze crops. Um, like she was saying, she drives down the road and smells the hemp. I mean, that's this is a farming community. This is farming. I can assure you there won't be any smell from ours, but it's sort of weird sometimes when I hear people talk about the smell. Well, they don't say anything about them making beer. They don't say anything about them making hay or corn, um, but they have to say something about cannabis because it's a new unknown product. So that's just my take on it. Um, but I can but I can assure you this is uh control controlled environmental <laughs> agriculture cea this is indoor agriculture and it's highly um technical and no smell will be getting outside of our building okay thank you um, Mr. Chamberlain. yes and i could just give some perspective I've, I've uh myself worked on at least half a dozen projects with with cannabis cultivation generally uh would back up what ken's saying there 
there is a regulation, no odor at the property line. When I go to Holyoke and there, there are certain areas where I get a little waft, which are probably coming from some carbon filter that wasn't changed appropriately, but um, when, uh, but if appropriately designed and maintained, uh, what Ken saying should be true. Um, you know, one thing that uh, Waitley's board that was concerned about this uh, issue on one of our projects, uh, you know, simply wrote in a condition that the planning board, you know, if there was a complaint, the planning board reserved the right to, to bring in an expert to, to check up on them and, you know, if there was odor present at the, um, at the property line to then, you know, require the applicant to take on some kind of study or means to correct it. Uh, I think that's probably covered in your bylaw anyway, uh, but they felt better explicitly putting it on as a condition. And at least my client had no problem with it because it was simply a condition that stated thou shalt follow the law. <laughs> Correct. Thank you. Um, and then actually one other thing that, that perked my ears just a couple minutes ago that may be a little bit of a technical issue. Um, according to the bylaw, any permits issued here under shall be issued to the marijuana establishment owner. Um, so, and this may be a question that the board needs to think about is, would the special permit apply to the third party operator of the lab? Um, because the special permit typically goes with the use, uh, whereas the site plan review probably covers the building. Um, so if that's a different licensee, then it may need to be a separate special permit, um, or there may be a means to cover that under this special permit if the board wants to. I, I'm not totally clear on that. All right, thank so you for bringing that forward. We might have, we'll check that out. That's a good point. I think I, think, I, think I can address <laughs> this for you. So at the present time, Confidence Analytics has been in town, in talks with the town for a very long time. They haven't got any response. They can't even get an HCA um, completed. Um, we have alternate motives for that building. Um, we're not positive they're going to get an HCA and come here. And we're going to, if that's the case, um, we will be using that building for our own manufacturing purposes, um, where we might be making edibles in there. Um, since we don't have a lot of room in our cultivation for manufacturing edibles. So we don't really know yet um, if the town is going to um, issue that HCA. Um, we don't know what's going on. They haven't really had much contact with, with confidence analytics. So I can assure you, if, if, if that doesn't happen, we'll be using that ourselves. Um, regardless, we own it. It's ours. We're going for the permit, um, and we'll be using it. Um, if, if, they don't, if they don't lease it, we'll be using it ourselves. Okay. Right, Chris, well, thank you. For I have one more question re uh, relative to that then. So manufacturing that you would do, maybe you would do more if you had that building. Um, would um, confidence analytics, would they be testing other, are, would they be a test site for other grow sites? Yes, they'll be testing product from all over the state. They'll be sending mm -hmm. out their truck and they go get sample, little samples, you know, like this big, okay. and then they, they bring them back and test them gotcha. um, for, other, for, for other places. Now I can assure you, um, with the testing labs, uh, the, this is the first lab that ever tested a legal sample of marijuana in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, they've been in business for over 12 years. They just received a license in California, um, which is the hardest state to try to get a license. Um, so they are, you know, they're a very reputable um, group of people. Um, I've used them for many years. Um, they're the only people I would like to use. And that's the reason I'm bringing them. Um, I'd like to have them come here with us because uh, there is a little bit of gray area around these, uh, you know, around these testing labs. Um, and these, I'm very confident um, with the reputation that these people have. Great. That's um, so I, I would just recommend then that the, that because uh, right now the record is uh, full of that being a testing facility. So if that's potentially going to be a manufacturing facility that should be clearly shown and the, the board be affirmatively approving that. Otherwise, you're going to have issues down the road with a building permit. 
How can that be when we own that property? That's ours and it's used. And this is a cannabis site and we're going to be using it for cannabis. So yeah, regardless they're, whether they're testing it or whether I'm manufacturing it, it's the same. It's we own it. It's ours. Yeah, but you, you've got an entire plan that's showing that that's going to be a testing building. So if it might be something else, that should be clear in the record because your site plan approval is going to be for a cultivation building a dispensary manufacturing building and the testing building. So, um, so I, maybe, they, maybe no, they can, maybe they can put a condition in there that says that if they, if they aren't issued an HCA by the town, which has been very hard for them to get, then we will be using, you know, that for man, our own manufacturing. It may require just a quick trip back here just to tell us, and then us putting that, 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 that's very possible. Yeah, and if there's a condition in there, that's fine. So if the if the you know the the town doesn't issue an HCA to a testing lab, um, then certainly there's a condition in there. That let the planning board know. That's fine with us. Yeah, I, I don't hope. necessarily see a problem with that being a condition that that could alternatively be used as a as a manufacturing. Um, I don't know that. I think it would be good to uh, just make sure that there wouldn't be any required changes to the site plan uh, if it does have to serve for manufacturing, because if there are any significant changes to that, then that would have to come back. Um, again, I'm trying to save anybody some some technical issues down the road. That's all. The building wouldn't change uh, if they don't build the it, it's it's just the open shell Butler building as is. Um, they would do, you know, the TIs on the inside, which would be setting up the labs in there. Um, if they, if that doesn't come to fruition, um, we would be using the exact same footprint. Everything's exactly the same. We would just be using that for manufacturing. Well, potentially, maybe this is something that Mr. Chamberlain, Mr. Furman, and you can could work on in terms of it may not, we're not talking about perhaps a big change in verbiage with the, the site plan that it might be for testing or for manufacturing and that might just cover it right there <clears throat> yeah if, if there wouldn't be exterior changes then i think the site plan would be fine with some notation um, and then it's up to the, the planning board you know annalee you, you talked about needing so, to review some information on the interior in these unique projects um so presumably the interior would be different it's up to the board whether that is relevant um, as to which direction I'm not the building sure that goes. It is, right. Right. Okay. So maybe the certainly uh the three of you could <clears throat> discuss if if we can't have more, I mean, I think the planning board would certainly prefer that um things are as clear as possible in the first round of site plan review. So you don't have to come back to us with a change of circumstances. I think you'd probably prefer that also. <clears throat> All right, anything else, uh, planning board, any other questions? And otherwise, I think we will be continuing this to um, our May meeting. Well, looks like not. All right, this has been a very um, helpful meeting. Thank you all. And also, I think the level of, of uh, detail has been um, just spot on. So thank you. Good. All right. Then we will um, uh, continue this to our May meeting. And uh, I think that's it for this evening. Is that okay with everyone? Uh, could, could, could you confirm the date of the May meeting? Is it the first? Because May is that special oh. month with... Yes. I uh, got it just here. Maybe whether or not Amy's here too. It's but Yes. It's on the... May 8th, I believe. Yes, May 8th. May 8th. 6.30. Very good. Thank you so much. Yes, got it. Thank you. All right. Thank you all. Thank you for your time this evening. Have a good night. All right. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye. So moving on with our agenda. Um, uh, we did, as the planning board knows, but record for public record, we did have our focus meeting with uh, Peggy Sloan on beginning our chapter 179 review. I think on one hand, um, certainly the feedback I've received, you know, Peggy is very knowledgeable. She's very comforting. And it seems like 
Annalie, I'm, I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt, but is it possible to move the ANR in front of this because oh. we have people sitting here waiting that I think would really Goodness. appreciate that and we're going to be here anyway, so. Well, sure, got it. Let's got go it. for that. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> And I think um, Bob Walden is also <laughs> in waiting for it also. So um, if we can have a presentation on the ANR and um, uh, I could probably also pull up the map if, if need be. Please. Yeah. Okay. Oops, wait a second here, screen share. Oh, no, you guys can't see that, can you? It's upside down too. Uh, uh oh what happened uh, got it. well let's see remote how do we mm, well we might just have to be sort of crooked here that's good that's good okay so i'm not sure if you could introduce yourselves and um uh, sure. Good evening. Uh, I'm John Cunningham. <clears throat> My wife, Helene, and I own the land uh, abutting Mr. Rodriguez's parcel C that we're asking for the ANR, um, says their land of John Helene Cunningham. It, it was originally parcel B, of Mr. Rodriguez's land, and was parceled off, and we purchased it uh, with the belief that it was a building lot. And um, we had a building permit issued to us recently, but then a concern was raised about the minimum lot width on one boundary line, um, which according to footnote six of the dimensional requirements was uh, in question. And so uh, we received a letter on March 27th, last Monday, saying that it's now a non-conforming a lot. Um, and so Mr. Rodriguez has agreed to create parcel C and we have a purchase and sale agreement to buy it and we're going to combine it with parcel B and then we will have uh, a conforming building lot as directed by the building commissioner to help us make sure it is conforming. So the, there's a the triangle of about 861.57 square feet parcel C um, and we also have a restriction on the purchase and sale to say the land will stay as a lawn, no fencing, no driveway, no structures. It will not change its appearance. It will change its ownership only as far as what it's attached to. Um, and so um, and you have the original Form A that uh, Alex Rodriguez submitted. And um, I'm not sure what else I can tell you that the, the new boundary line will be conforming with the minimum lot width requirement. I'm sorry, excuse me, this is Rachel Blaine. I'm asking about, is the restriction on the landscaping, or is that in the deed? It's in our purchase and sale agreement for parcel C, and I'm not sure how it will be carried forward, but we intend to, it's lawn now, it's gonna stay lawn, we're not going, you know, yeah. in our minds. It, Just uh, I'm, I, it, it, at, at the sale, at a sale at a time when none of us are going to be here anymore. Yeah. Um, How, however it is supposed to be done, I will okay. make sure it gets done because All right. it was well, my, I, idea, it was my idea. To the Rodriguez, you see there, I mean, at some point you can write it out of the deed, but if he wants it in the deed, then yeah. that's my curiosity. You know, our respective attorneys, I'm sure, will guarantee that it gets properly handled. <laughs> Yeah. Um, um, Mr. Walden, um, say, oops, sorry, this is Andrea. I just, I have a question about why it's necessary if it's not a building lot. No, it will become a conforming it's building a when building. we. But you won't build on it. No, yeah. No, we, we tried. We had a building permit. We hope to get it back and continue building. Oh, I see. So the grass and the uh, et cetera. Just this just area. Extra. We will build our house over in the area that says. I see. Okay. None of that area, even you know, even down towards Gramaki from parcel C is gonna have anything but one telephone pole, I mm -hmm. think, is to win there. But that's all going to be not driveway, not fence, not structure. Okay. And our driveway will come in closer to the inflection point when you come up. Mm -hmm. And the commissioner has our plot plan and he's looked at it. And... Yeah, I can get a little light on it. 
Um, originally, when we did the A and R, I mean, I misunderstood the footnote six that you have to get 50 foot depth from a perpendicular line from all boundaries. And that was brought up during a variance request by Mr. Cunningham with the zoning board that it was a non-conforming lot. So we had town council look at it and she agreed. So the solution is to buy that small triangle parcel C because of that was the issue. The, that one line you couldn't measure perpendicularly and, and get 50 feet. So now he will be able to. Uh, it's a very confusing footnote. Um, so this was this was less. This line was less than 50. Excuse me. If, yeah, if you measure 90 degrees off that line towards the road, you had less than 50. It was the only line that you had that issue. So this is correcting that issue so that it'll be a conforming lot according to what town council said right. and i will give him back his building permit <laughs> <laughs> and he's very anxious to get it back so and, and um i think this is good because it brings footnote six into the zoning review and it needs uh, even the attorney in the letter states that yeah. the illustrations are confusing mm -hmm. and we went by the illustrations yeah. and, and that what confuses it more is footnote seven, which says you discount that area as that where you can't get the 50 feet as building area. So that's where I was under the impression originally that it was a building lot, but mm -hmm. it turns out they think the intention is that you have to be able to get the 50 foot off of all property lines. So this is just clarifying that and making sure he has 50 feet measured with a perpendicular line off the boundary. But the next person will have a better footnote, I hope, in the future. Yes. Yeah. yeah. This is this is why I, I brought this up, I, and I put it on the agenda for your um, bylaw meeting because it, it really has just caused no end of trouble. Thanks, Amy. Mm -hmm. All well, right. Can I move? That we. Yes. Are we? Yes. Uh, endorse. I move to that we endorse the ANR as presented. Um. I second that. That's right, Mr. Mason. Mm -hmm. Is there any further discussion? <clears throat> All right. Uh, let's see. So, uh, Andrew or um, Emily Gaylord. Emily Gaylord, yes. Kathy Trova. Kathy Trova, yes. Kathleen Sylvester. Kathy Sylvester, yes. Oh, it's Andrea. I can't see. You're so tiny, <laughs> Andrea. Andrea Leibson, yes. <laughs> Denise Mason. Denise Mason, yes. Rachel Blaine, yes. Emily Wolfley, yes. So the uh, a &R is endorsed, and at the end of the meeting, you all can sign it with the Mylar Sharpie. Yeah, actually, can I just mention, I uh, forgot to put out a Sharpie. However, um, there is one. I left our office open so that someone could go in it just, just for this reason. Um, you'll find one on my desk, um, or if Denise knows where the supply closet is, I apologize for that. I just forgot that you'd need a Sharpie to sign it. And I guess, Annalie, maybe you can come in tomorrow and sign it. Oh, no. Oh, he's got a Sharpie. There we go. Oh, no, fantastic. No, we need a special Sharpie. Special. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> Anna's prepared. Bob, thank you very much for all thank of your work on this. Sounds like there's a lot in the background, so. Appreciate I mean, there are there are sharpies in the kitchen in the metal cabinet. If you can't find one in the okay. office, Emily, can we sign it now instead of at the end of the meeting so that these people can leave if they want to? Well, we don't, they don't oh, they don't need to see it. They don't, oh, don't oh, have to oh, wait. Okay. They yeah. don't need to. I'm perfectly trusting that you'll. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> thank you. And then, yeah, Annalie will need to sign, so uh, John can pick it up Bob later. They got me through this, and I appreciate them. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> all right thank you very much um, <clears throat> so let's see just this was just brief with our 179 review <clears throat> i was just reminded planning for tonight's meeting um that i believe the 179 review and some of I, I, ha I did have a follow-up conversation with peggy and then also she sent me a few questions that were quite 
technical about the maps and um, it was just such a reminder of needing and wanting to have a planner so I did send a um, an email tonight to the members of the select board I mean they have been very very supportive of planner and um, Casey and Brenda also have been wonderful with sort of juggling different funds to see if we can at least get a 30 hour position but it's not over till it's over so I've asked the select board if there's anything more that we can do to help lobby for that I believe um, next week and I don't know if anyone has that in front of them I can look on my calendar here the the um, final or a um, a select board meeting they're talking about the budget again and then I think I believe also those continuing finance committee meetings are talking about the budget so I don't know if anybody has any suggestions uh we've kind of morphed from FERCOG 179 review into still really working for the planner um Annalie I know that um the finance committee had already voted yes and so did the select board the select board said that they wanted a 40 hour position um starting 40 hours and so it may have to be reduced but i think the general consensus was in support for that for a planner oh i i i think you're absolutely on target it's uh you know quote may have to be reduced and what might be happening in those last minute conversations and whether or not there's anything more we can do to um, you know, attend the meeting, I guess. But at this point, I don't know. <clears throat> and I, th I think there was there was talk about having to reduce. I mean, uh, Brenda and Casey work really hard on that. I mean, I'm on the CIPC, and then I uh, went to one of the joint meetings. And I think one um, wild card was a CPA um, application that had not been submitted at you know on time. But I think that has been accepted so far. So I think it's really just going to come down to town meeting and voting on each. Oh, well, <clears throat> yeah, if that's the case, then if as much as um, those of us can really lobby to get friends, neighbors, and countrymen to, mm -hmm. and women to uh, come to town meeting and vote for it. Mm -hmm. Don't say that lightly, but really getting people to come to town meeting, this town meeting. Uh, I think yeah. between uh, the planner and ADU regulations. Yes. Get a good turnout. Um, yes. And I was just thinking similar. Um, Kathy and Rachel and I have been working on material around ADUs that I think I can probably send around to. Am I allowed to email that to everyone or do it, should I submit it for the next meeting packet? Oh, no. Yeah. You can probably BCC it. BCC is good, but yeah. Actually, um, what Casey was saying to me today was that if you send it to me, it's okay. The way to, to distribute things is you guys send it to me and then I send it out and somehow that makes it okay. It's And also it's good that I have a record of it to keep it, um, you know, that way if we need to go back, I've got all the records in one place. So Emily, if you want to send that to me, I will distribute it. Um, and maybe we want to create something similar for the planner. This is a handout mm -hmm. to give to town. Yeah. I mean, oh, yeah, that was so, wonderful. Yeah, I just think that um, one of the things that I think I'm very cognizant of is what happens in this room and in this meeting can feel really above a lot of heads, sometimes our own, <laughs> I yes. think. And it's a planner's whole job to make this information accessible and understandable. And I don't, we were just swooning over um, like, drawings of what a downtown could look like which is exactly what a planner would do for us so i think in terms of materializing so much of what we want for this town a planner would help us do that and maybe if people understand that that's going to connect some of the vision to something that they can actually visualize that might be helpful so that would be, i think that would be great Okay, um, em Emily, I just have a question. So in doing that, I mean, are you going to do it on one document, which would be better than multiple documents, maybe? Sorry. I don't know. And if so, I was going to say, please add the permitting software, because that is another critical piece that will okay. help us out, because it's going to help Amy out, it's going to help the building, it's going to help everyone out. So, so our suggestion is one document with ADUs, I planner and permitting software on yeah. it. 
and, and a, to make to make the town work more efficiently. Yes. And a short blurb. And I mean, if yeah, I mean, yeah. for each. And I mean, I know I'm, I'm, my wheels are turning around. Like, we, yeah. I mean, we can always make suggestions on yeah, what to include yeah, in the blurb. That would be yeah. very helpful. So why don't I do this? I'll send Amy what we have so far for the ADU, just so that you all have something to react to. And then um, Denise, would you send me just some bullet points on the permanent stock? Sure. Cause I'm going to get that from Amy if I don't already have that. <laughs> And then we'll um, maybe Annalie could send me some planner bullet sure. points. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, cool. And then I'll, I'll think of some way to make this resonate with our right. residents. I think the plan you might want to mention could maybe help us get funding. Oh, absolutely. Because yeah. that's yes. what people are going to do. How greater. much does a planner cost? Well, how much can they save is really and, Yes. And I think it's all about investing in the future right this is the idea that we want to and build the planner's the not just for the planning board the yeah for for that, the town. Town. that exactly. is the important piece one of well, the, all of these things well, should yeah. be for well, the town yeah well yeah well but the other boards are going to also yeah. it's not just self-serving um yeah yeah okay excellent good oh i'm so glad that's great <laughs> adjourn <laughs> um <Yeah. laughs> excuse me <laughs> um I will, let's see here, screen share and bring up our planning board policy, which actually, um, <clears throat> as of last, um, let's see, where am I here? <laughs> yeah, actually, the screen share, I don't know how it went, anyway. <laughs> um, oh, okay. I, I'm like, sorry. You can see that? Is that yeah. good -ish? Good enough. Um, so the, the beginning point for this was recognition that, gosh, you know, two years ago at several different meetings, we talked about how planning board documents needed to be distributed or uh, sent to us two to three business days before our meeting. You know, when we were, is it two? Is it three? And who knows it other than us? And it put certainly put Amy and the town staff in, in a bind when they're trying to tell people, no, you can't, don't expect to talk with the planning board because you didn't send this stuff out in time. So in any event, um, talking with Ken Comia, the planner from PVPC, um, certainly a lot of other boards do have standard operating procedures. So have really, really, um, condensed what a lot of the other boards have, but statement that this would be something that would be um, posted. I mean, it's it's in town clerk and whatnot, but it would be posted on the town website and um, pieces of it then could also bleed over into our applications. Um, one of the things that just changed within the last month or with the la within the last time that everyone here has seen the draft of this policy is our Supreme Judicial Court ruling that during public comment, uh, members of the public need not be courteous, considerate, respectful. Um, they do need to be courteous, considerate, respectful during our business meeting, but if we are having public comment, periods um they don't need to be um that's what the supreme judicial court just said within the last month so i have adapted this according to that and in fact part of what ken has said as well as my understanding from town council is that so much of this is at this chair's discretion, which I think also is very challenging because we can't show favoritism. So I think it needs to say in the policy that it would be at the chair's dis discretion, even to even to say that we could have public comment. Um, hey, I have a question. So the document you have up there, did I miss something? Because the document I have says February 21st. Yeah, yeah. so as of tonight, what I did basically was just this section, change okay. just this section. Okay, so you'll send that out to us. Yeah, Please. yes. Yeah. Well, that would be helpful. Yeah. You know, and 
Okay. You know what? I, I know this is a little bit of a sidebar, but while we're on the subject, I find it extremely confusing. And sorry, Amy, I know that there were multiple <laughs> times that you had to change the agenda, but I had downloaded the whole packet and then all of a sudden, all the changes were made. And so in order for me to understand what changes were made, I had to look through the entire packet again. So in the future, does it make sense to, if there's a change, just to note what the change was, to say, addition to the packet, this is it, or reduction or, or something, instead of sending out the whole thing again? I, I don't know what others feel, think, Yeah, that would but be I, I just, I was having a hard time because there were like five different changes. And I understand okay. that's not the problem. It's just that it was like having to read through the whole thing. I mean, look through all the documents again, because there were like 32 pages. 34. 34. And then, I, I tried to uh, describe in my emails what had been changed. Maybe I, um, but, you know, originally the idea of the packet was because people had too many different documents and they you know and that was a problem because they were looking at this one looking at that one um you know it seems like usually that there really shouldn't be this many changes <laughs> this this was unusual i have to say i mean i can try and, and keep the changes down and you know right. i can send separate documents but like i said when i you know when it used to be separate documents people complained that they didn't like having all the different documents no, i think that uh, this is andrea i think a packet is great mm -hmm. but if you could also say please disregard packet sent on this date at this time so that we know that the let the later one is more um up to you know accurate Complete. Yeah, yeah, probably I, I should have renamed it, uh, you know, continued well, to rename the revisions, which I, I think, think I didn't do. So also I apologize what, for that. No, what Denise is maybe requesting, Denise, is that this packet updates the minutes of February 6th. Right. Yeah. Yeah, well, like I said, I'm I'm happy to do that, but I'm just saying that you know the reason that I started with the packets as a single issue is that people complained about having too many, you know, didn't like having different documents. No, so we, it's sort of yeah. a you know. <laughs> no, thanks. We appreciate yeah. the packet. Yeah, we like that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. So, um, although we can, I mean, we can even vote on this at our next meeting if we need to, but that you know, this is in fact sort of you know we don't really have much leeway about this other than that we've said that uh we want people to be two to three minutes in in length and recognized by the chair um one of the things that some of the other agenda uh some of the other towns have mentioned is that and obviously um and we've had this members of the public can request certain things be on the agenda so this is up for discussion and may not, uh, you know, a lot of the towns say, if you want to submit something for the agenda, you need to submit it within, you know, five business days prior to the board's meeting. And the agenda request may or may not be approved. How do people feel about that? Oh, uh, yes. I mean, we do that with the select board as well, don't we? If we want the select board to discuss some issue, right? we, we make a request of the select board to include it on a, an agenda for a meeting but at the bottom it says it may or may not be discussed no. i think on the bottom of the select yeah. board well it says agenda request may or may not be approved at the discretion of the chair mm -hmm. that's good mm -hmm. and the, we're saying that they need to be submitted five business days in advance of the meeting i mean mm -hmm. is that a reasonable time people feel yes Okay. Yeah, I don't feel like I need five business days personally, but well, we're saying for people in the of the public. Does. Amy does. Okay, and that's fine. I just I'm not going to read it before Thursday. Anyway, usually, so right. <laughs> so five days is what Tuesday the week before, mm -hmm. correct? Yeah. I think agenda items would be for the chair anyway. You know, they would go to the chair. The chair can decide what's on the agenda, and then you know, then it would go out to you guys in the agenda. Yeah. So Amy, you need five days. Well, well, this is the problem that we just had with the with the packet that came and kept having changes and changes and changes. If we set the agenda five days before and then someone asks us to add something two days, three days before, 
Now it's not on the agenda. Then she has to redo the packet. Right. So if we didn't have it five days in advance, if we had it, then it can't, then it could go to the next meeting. But I mean, the problem that came up here is because we require five days. Which problem? Well, no, the five days, this is just a proposal. Right now, we don't have, I mean, this is, again, it's primarily as people request, hmm, it doesn't say this, but request for agenda items should be submitted. Yeah, no later than five business days. That's that's a, that's something new. We've not really talked about this before. Current it currently says two to three. Is that what you're saying? No. The two to three or what we've had before, that's for if documents are submitted. That's a different topic. This is just agenda items. I feel like it is very reasonable to say if you didn't submit something more than five days in advance, it just goes to the next meeting. Like right, but, what, but why does it keep getting amended then? Because we're not sticking to that, obviously. Well, I don't think it's well, no, this is This is something new. This is, we have not done this in the past. This would be new. Okay. No, I mean, that's fine. <laughs> I thought you were saying that I, I didn't get it because I kept, I, I thought we had a, a deadline and then we keep getting amendments. And I'm like, wait a minute. I thought we had a deadline. We're not sticking to it. So I misunderstood. Well, well that's why it's nice to have, I guess, something in writing because our deadline really has to do with submission of documents. Yeah. And at times we've said two days prior to a business meeting. At other times we've said three days. Um, yeah. And it's not really written down anywhere for a John Furman or a Berkshire Design to know that they need to give us our the peer review document, not the afternoon of. <laughs> right. right, right. Or the Friday afternoon. I thought we had Monday something evening. already. I thought we it's already new. had something. It's we, yeah. Yeah. we do. Can I just, we do. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll mention, and then Amy, you can. We have we have had something, Kathy, but it's been quite loose. Is it two days? Is it three days? No, we, and we have something. Yeah, it's it's very specific. It's in the minutes, and I brought it up after I forget what meeting, how long ago, and documents came in too quickly. I I believe it's the Tuesday. I'd have to look it up, but it's in your minutes. Um, I we did this. Already. We sent it out. It was very specific, but um, it was in the minutes. The public doesn't know this. Yeah, no, I, I, I understand that. I'm just saying that, that you do have right. something very specific. The other thing, can I just say that the, the changes, the reason, you know, so many packets and agendas, th this was internal issues. It's not because people were sending yeah. things to us late. These were all internal, th you know, yeah. things happen, things change. Mentally so, editing but... things and things missed, yeah. So for submission of documents as as amy has said i think it was august of 2020 right we said two to three days well is it two is it three, three. what do we want you know and this is this is for our discussion right now because then then we'll have it in you know we'll have it in a, a planning board document that will be on the website and you know potentially even also in some of our applications Okay. I always thought it was Thursday before the meeting. Did I, did I, I mean, I thought we yeah, changed I, Thursday. I, I believe, as I said, I looked it up in the minutes from that meeting and you were very specific. It wasn't two or three. It was very specific. It was Tuesday or Wednesday before the meeting. And I will look that up and again, and I will send it out to all of you. So, I mean, you well, can okay. certainly change it if you want to, but I'm just saying that there, yeah. there is something that was voted on. That's what we're talking about right now. If it's three days, three full business days, so that would be the morning of Thursday, right? No. It's yeah, full. three full business days, Thursday, Friday, Monday. Monday's a business day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All day. <laughs> All day, a lot of business. That's what we're expecting. Can I make another suggestion, Annalie? <laughs> One of the last emails that I got today was, I think you made some amendment to the minutes. And can we, just, can we just amend them here instead of doing that? Because that was yet another one. And you know what? I didn't even look at that. Sure. Because by, the, by the time I looked at that in my email, I thought, I don't have time to look at this one. So if we could just you know save any kind of amendments to the minutes that we all look at, Sure. To make a change during the meeting, which is probably, I mean, I don't even know what change was made. I think you said it was in formatting. Yeah. Was it? Yes. Okay. Yeah. It was just miscellaneous stuff. That's so anyway, back to submission of documents. 
what do we want to have posted on our website, maybe part of the applications? What do we want to have as a as our policy going forward? Is this I have a question we, for Amy. How long does it take her to um, process things yeah. or make copies? That's really part of the issue. It's for so that the staff is not overwhelmed at the last minute. Like in other words, we want you to make the yes. You tell us. <laughs> you Amy. tell us what you need, what time you need. Thanks. Um, yeah, if things come in, you know, if we want to make the deadline for you guys to be, you know, I've been getting things out to you, I guess, by the end of the day, Thursday. So you have the the two, you know, working days and, and the weekend, obviously, to look at stuff. So, so um, the end of your workday on Thursday, four o'clock ish. If we tell people that they can get them to us on Thursday and they come in Thursday at five. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 no. We don't want to tell people that they can come in that's Thursday because, yeah, that's, and, and even Wednesday, they can. Um, well, plus, sometimes, sometimes, we do sometimes not have meetings on Monday. So I think just yeah. stating. Yeah, I, I, yeah, you're probably right. X number of business days, you know, we three or four. Um, I say five, like if people are submitting documents. It's not like this is a surprise. Three or five and, you know, every now and then, uh, yeah, that's, yeah, I think, yeah, five, five would certainly be more than enough. Well, when we think back to um, the yeah. park, we were getting documents that afternoon. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Peer review sometimes is not ready. Certainly peer review, might not be ready five days prior to a meeting. I don't know. Well, I, I think what we can do is make, you know, have a general rule and we can make exceptions, um, you know, for specific cases like the, you know, John's ANR, we, he didn't have all the documents ready on time, but this was really sort of an emergency situation. And because part of the problem had been caused by uh, us, you know, I, I was fine with him giving me, you know, he, he had the plan on Friday um, and giving me the, the signed um, ANR, you know, later that I, we made an exception in that case. Yeah. And I think maybe the exceptions and I can run it past the chair. Um, but so I would yeah. say I mean, the ANR exception also, if we don't deal with it within, I think it isn't 30 days, it's yeah. just automatically. Yeah. I mean, I, I know that I, as the chair, would like not to make exceptions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, I, as long as I get everything on Thursday, I don't care what we do. I mean, it's whatever Amy needs to get us the stuff by Thursday. So do you need it in by Wednesday? Do you need it in by Tuesday? That's totally your call, in my opinion. I just want it by Thursday. Yeah. I think it's important that we make the decision and we put it on the website under the planning board. And we also put it on our applications <laughs> too, so that people know right up front. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've got this wrong here. Where it says Wednesday morning for a board meeting on Monday, it would be Thursday morning for a board meeting on Monday, right? Wednesday That's night. three full business days. Well, Thursday, Friday, Friday, Monday. Monday. I would like to. I would like to call it Tuesday night because people will uh, interpret Monday morning as like, well, you know, tens morning, eleven. If say Wednesday four o'clock. Okay, four let's, yeah, let's, yeah, let's let's call it. Yeah. Was that enough time for you, Amy? Yep. Yeah. That could that gives you okay. that gives everyone ample time. Wednesday, I'm gonna say four and four. Yeah, I agree. Sort of close of business. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think that's it. So do you want can we approve this policy now or do you want to look at it more and have it back on the agenda next month? I am ready to approve it. Okay. Yeah. I make a motion we approve the document as amended. I second it, Rachel Lane. That was Kathy Sylvester. There any further discussion? Um, so Emily Gaylord. Emily Gaylord, yes. Kathy Vitroba? 
Which will be us. Um, let's see, uh, Kathy Sylvester. Kathy Sylvester, yes. Andrea Liebson. Yes, Andrea Liebson. <laughs> Denise. Denise, yes. Mitchell Blaine, yes. Emily will call yes, so it's approved 600. Um, Send us out the amended, the amended version so that I have the correct version. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Is this really the URL for the anti hate statement in the code of conduct? Oh, uh, in a policy? Yeah. It's, like, is it really? Is that the link? That that US correct? slash search question mark search phrase equals code. For see. Shorter. So, well, I guess it, it should be. Um, oh, let's make sure. I'll make sure. Yeah. Open source meeting announcement. That's that I just wonder yeah. those, yeah. I mean, this would be, yes. Mm -hmm. Code of conduct and the select for and a hate statement. Yep. And the open meeting laws. Yeah, those should be, yes. So okay. meeting. I mean, I can't. No, you put it on. Well, let me do it now. You label it with the name, and then you just hit the name. Yeah, like hyperlink the. Yes. Yeah. Hyperlink. Yeah, exactly. Gosh, even I know that. <laughs> well, then, shall we? Can I? I'm not into hyperlinks. So, uh, uh, Emily, can you hyperlink for me? I'll send it to you. <laughs> I can too. I know how to hyperlink. Well, thanks. For while I'm doing other things. Uh, yeah. Yes. Amy, do you know how to hyperlink? I'm sure she does. Yes, you need me. You send me the document, and I'll make whatever needs to be a hyperlink a hyperlink. Cool. All right. Okay. So that'll go to Amy and Sid. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much, Amy. Okay. Cool. Woo. Um. Stops. Are you still seeing it? No. No. Clear. We just see you <laughs> and us. I'm Kathy. There we go. All righty. Um, let's see, do we have anyone, I don't even know if we have anyone still on um, Zoom, but any public comments? Nope. No other business reasonably anticipated reports? Uh, open space, I can make a report. Um, a working group of the open space committee met today. We are um, taking seriously this idea of having greater communication with uh, uh, residents of Deerfield. And so we are creating a one sheet handout for the annual meeting to talk about the results of the survey, uh, the open space survey to tell people um, uh, what we are, what, what Deerfield has as a result of the survey in part, and to say what we are planning to do next. Excellent. Cool. I have a short report too. Yes, Denise. Wait, communication is happening. That's great. Uh, yeah. Okay, so I think, I, I forget what date, but a couple of weeks ago, Governor Healy and Lieutenant Governor Driscoll came out. They were at William Sugar House, and they were amazing. And I think that, I think that, um, they're they're very receptive to um, what we're doing out here, and they created a new I forget what it's called a new rural something or other mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. represent the rural rural community. Mm -hmm. And our new what is the Secretary of Agriculture is a Deerfield native. She wants to be in the parade, which is cool. But um, <laughs> whoa, the hmm? Secretary. <laughs> Um, Ashley um, Sears, Ash Semple or Stemple? Oh, no, not Stemple. Semple? Yeah, no, 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 no. Sears. Ashley Sears, and, and, she, and she's married, and her, she's married named, name. her name is yes. Sears. Yes. Anyway, she went. She went to grade school with my son. She's very yeah. and my daughter. So, yeah. So anyway, so she wants to do that, and then I did. I did. I handed out postcards, our CCI postcards, to. Oh boy. Anyway, one of one of Healy's representatives. Um, let's see. So that that was really good. The um, I'm on the library building committee, so we're talking about building the bill. I mean, looking at the building, looking at what they're doing, um, changing instead of going backwards, it's going to go the so, addition to the south, so we can add solar to it, which is really important. And that down that beautiful tree. Yeah. Um, let's see what else is going on. Took a tour of the 1821 building with for the potential senior center with Waitley and Sunderland. Oh. And, and um, sorry, 
you know, <laughs> right, right. Right. I'm Sunderland. explaining what I don't know, know. the 1821 building. Uh, the church. I'm sorry, the okay. church. So I, I feel like we're sort of back in square one with that, but you know, we, we have to figure that out because we've been writing, we're in the process of writing grant funding for that. So we've got to get together and have a little better communication with them. Um, I also attended a DOT meeting and that is, that's really important because our town common, the problem is, is that Sugarloaf Street and Park Street mm -hmm. and going up to Conway Street is still owned by the state and they want us to take it over. We don't want to take it over until we camera to see with the infrastructure underneath, which is very important. Um, I know that the cost of doing the town common has escalated to the tune of, I mean, another couple hundred thousand dollars. So, you know, we're sort of, so it's still in conversation with them. And I think that they're going to uh, give us a price on how much it would be to camera everything. So that's still a, a conversation in progress. Um, let's see what else. Uh, so, oh, and in the meantime, uh, Tim Hilchi, I worked with him a little bit on, well, he did most of the writing. I was like his support system <laughs> with this and wrote um, for three different things. He wrote to, um, to Warren, to McGovern, and to Markey um, for an earmark for the 18 1888 building, which was the prior senior center grade school. Um, and that's the plan is to hopefully move this building, the municipal building over there. Offices. Municipal. Offices. So I'm looking for an earmark for about $5 million. And the last thing is um, on Wednesday, I've got um, people from VHB that are coming out to do a tour of the campus for um, some grant money that we got through complete neighborhoods. And after that, they'll be meeting oh, yeah. with CCI, with the, the committee, and talking about how they can have you know, better communication in town among, you know, the people so that so Deerfield residents know what's going on. So that's it. Emily can do a flyer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Yeah. No, as a matter of fact, they do have a graphic designer on board. Um, <laughs> we don't have to do any reporting for that, and we don't have to handle any money for that. So it's, we've got $50,000 worth of of um people to help us <laughs> that's great that's it that's a lot um any other reports i could report on the cpc which we're uh, voting on designating money for um the senior housing project mm -hmm. which they're hoping to purchase some property to expand that piece of property um Which, and get a feasibility study going so they're going to they have applied for some some money from the cpc we i expect that to pass um, the 1888 building did request some money but their um, application is really not quite complete so we may we, we are going to table that until they get us more information and probably present that at the fall town meeting and there was a late applicant, which did cause a lot of stir, which was the select board who didn't submit their application in time, along with the superintendent to resurface the tennis courts. Yeah. So that was quite contentious because it was two and a half weeks late. Um, we did vote four to three to allow them to submit, but it's... Uh, didn't come without a cost of the resignation of the chair of our committee. Mm -hmm. So, unfortunately. Whoa. I think he was going to leave at the end of this year. But he's but decided to But, he's, but he, um, yeah. he's, so he I, effective immediately resigned yeah. after that. You know. So can I ask, so the resurfacing of the tennis courts, is, are other towns, yes. are the other yes. towns going to their CPC yeah. as well? Yes, yeah, so the, the budget from Frontier is going to pay for 200000 and they're asking for 100000 and that's going to be um, hopefully covered by the four towns. So I don't know how the other towns have voted. So no, maybe, I, Denise, you know? No, I mean, um, 
They asked for 48,000 from us. And I think we, we typically do 50% and the other towns do a lesser amount. I think it goes I according to the population. Percentage, but we don't have that much money in the CPC for, for that project. So um, they're going to have to get some of that money elsewhere. You have $24,000 left into the recreation part of the C CPC. So the rest would have to come out of something else in the budget. Yeah. And, you know, the problem was, is that there was, because I'm, I'm on the CIPC, the Capital Improvements Plan Committee. Mm -hmm. And um, so we went over that. And I think there was miscommunication between Frontier and, and our select board, and they apologized profusely. The issue is, is that our budget is so incredibly tight this year, I'm sure, you know, like many other years, that... Um, if we had to pull that out of our budget, we may have to reduce something else, like the planner or right. who knows what. Right. So, you know, it it was it was it was a very difficult situation. And I certainly understood the frustration for the CPC in that. Yeah. So, you know, hopefully that will not happen again. You know, that that miscommunication, and I think that is sort of the whole purpose of CCI of having, you know, better communication among all the boards in town. I uh, think, you know, yeah. Alan's worried about setting a precedent. Yeah. And I was worried about making the taxpayer pay for their mistake. So um, it was a very difficult vote for everybody, I think. Yeah. Wow. Okay. All right. That's sobering. Sobering. Right. <clears throat> Um, just a brief update, which ties into the planner. This perhaps should have been other business, not reasonably anticipated. Um, <clears throat> there is a concern about this set right, set right solar. Um, there were a, a number of conditions. This is interesting. This is sort of philosophical for the planning board. Number of conditions in the set right solar decision. Uh, some of the conditions having to do with uh, notices that need to go to the fire department and to the select board and to the planning board and whatnot. And um, to a large extent, it appears that a lot of those conditions have not been met. So kind of who has responsibility to oversee that? So I'm going to be talking. I asked uh, Chris Nolan, our assistant town administrator, if he can sit down with me and chat because the specific piece for a condition for the planning board of noting when um, the the facility, the, the solar is going online. That's just one. Yeah, I, I, yeah I, I don't think they've gone online yet, though. I think that's why we right. haven't. But there are other things yeah. that they haven't done yet. And who's checking to make sure that happens? And it was a planning board condition. So anyway, it's an, that's, you know, wouldn't it that's certainly something that a planner could oversee with a lot of our our decisions hey Anna Lee, that also that also goes into the importance of the planning software because it's something like that it's the fire department that needs to be notified the select board needs to be we need to be and if it's in that permitting software it automatically goes amy knows and she can notify everyone and it makes things so much smoother right that'd be great okay um, we did have some mail. Um, it's, it was interesting, and uh, it seems that there's quite a bit of activity going on in our adjoining towns with, you know, Waitley wants to put in nine residential units uh, with renovating a, an old school building. Um, Shelburne wants to put in some more affordable housing and cha actually change their affordable housing bylaws. Um, uh, Greenfield, oh my gosh, they have a ZBA meeting with four different public hearings, but um, also looking at increasing uh, 36 dwelling units in an area that's zoned for 24, putting in five multifamily dwelling units. So there's lots going on in our adjacent towns of trying to increase housing inventory. So we're trying to do the same, right? <laughs> Hey, Annalie, can I just make a note on that? I was, at a, I was at another thing. I was at the, I went with Pat Ryan to the uh, Franklin County League of Women's Women Voters wow. on Saturday at the Five Eyed Fox, which was very cool. I'd never been there. So I definitely want to go back. But it was great because Joe Comerford was there, Natalie Blay, and then um, 
what's her name? Susanna Whips. Whips, who is another amazing person. And so, she's an amazing lady. <clears throat> now, now. <laughs> she is wonderful. And so each one of them, I mean, they're just, they're so great and so supportive. That. And that came up, housing came up and different things. And they were so, they said, please email me. And they understand the issue with not having enough housing or be, you know, selling your home and not being able to buy into the same neighborhood. So that, you know, and, and they said, please email us, let us know what's going on. So nice. nice. Just Good. All right. Um, I don't know that we have anything else. I entertain a motion to adjourn. Um, I would like to move that we adjourn. Uh, second at 8.33. That's Rachel and Kathy Sylvester. Yes. Any discussion? All right. Uh, Emily Gaylord. Emily Gaylord, yes. Kathy Watroba. Oh, yes. <clears throat> Kathy Sylvester. Kathy Sylvester, yes. Andrew Leibson. Andrew Leibson, yes. Denise Mason. Denise Mason, yes. Rachel Blaine, yes. Emily Wolfkull, yes. Adjourned at 8.32 p.m. Bye.